Welcome back to the Bishy P podcast. Today, we're delighted to say we're joined by six-time Premier League winner, as well as four-time Scottish Cup winner and four-time Scottish League Cup winner and current Real Cashmere manager, David Robertson. Hello, David. Hi, how are you? Good. Yeah, good, thanks. Good and we're also joined by Mr McHugh and Mr Johnson. Hello, guys. Hello. Oh, very impressive, Mr Irvin. That was a good intro. Oh, I, I know. Mr cool. McHugh thought I was going to mock that bit up there, so <laughs> done well. How's your golf, Mr McHugh? I better. I beat you on Monday, so yeah. So it matters. The turn leg next week. Uh, yeah, that'll do. That'll do. Yeah. Um, so I'll kick us off today, David. Um, if you would mind, just tell us a wee bit about your school journey and your school career, please. Um, well, I started off um, in Aberdeen. Yeah, I was born in Aberdeen, 1968. So worked it out. I'm over 50 now, so um, knocking on in years, but. I started off at um, an infant school. I don't know if we still have infant schools nowadays, but I was at Drumgarth Infant School in Aberdeen in a, an estate, well, an area called Garth Dean. Then I moved into Inchgarth at primary school, then went to Harlow Academy in, in Aberdeen, um, which used to be, believe it or not, it used to be called the High School for Girls. Um, good. And there's Annie Lennox, if anybody knows that, Annie, Annie Lennox, you admit she went to that school. Yeah. So uh, that was that was my early part in school, probably not there. Yeah. Um, did you stay on for fourth year, fifth year, or did you leave um, I early? Fourth year. Um, I left at fourth year. I agreed to, to go professional. Um, yeah. In those days, I don't know if it's still the same, but I was a Christmas leaver, so I had to stay on for six months um, from the summer till the Christmas because I hadn't turned 16. Um, and then it was it was um, a bit of a waste of time, to be honest. Six months uh, just going to classes with Christmas leavers that didn't yeah. want to be at school. So, um, yeah. that was it. You just had to mark time. That's the way it was. Yeah. Uh, what was your kind of favourite subject at school? And was there MD in particular that was a kind of role model for you through your school well, there journey? Was, there was two. I was actually very, very fortunate. Um, I, I used to like history and uh, modern studies. Um, right. and obviously, PE, every, every, every sports person likes PE. Um, there's two people in particular, uh, the modern studies teacher was a guy called Dickie Ewing. Um, right. He actually played for Aberdeen and Rangers uh, many years ago. Um, so he was a modern studies teacher, but also took the, the secondary school team as well. We also had uh, Bobby Clark, if you remember Bobby Clark, Aberdeen goalkeeper. Yeah. He, he, um, he was the PE teacher there. So he took the PE, but, uh, Dickie Ewing. So they, they were influential. Turns out years later on, my mum and dad ended up staying next door to, to Dickie U. And then my son ended up playing for Bobby Clark's team in, uh, in America. So it, it's right. a small thing. That, that was the two real main people. And it was all football. Uh, yeah. So you, you went straight into professional football, didn't you? Can you tell us a wee bit about your kind of journey into that? Um, well, I signed schoolboy forms at 13. Um, Alex right. Ferguson signed me there. And I started yeah. to play in the reserves at 14. So... You know, a week for me would have been playing in the reserves, playing for the primary, uh, the, the high school team, playing for a boys club. Um, a little bit unusual to how things are these days. Um, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. when I got to 16, the summer, I signed a professional contract. Yeah, I still had to stay on um, for, I had to stay on till the Christmas time. Um, and that's yeah. the whole talk came about. Alec Ferguson was pretty influential in, in that in those days. He took a lot of interest in kids that, you know, he knew every youth player, 12, 13, 14 year olds when he was at Aberdeen, not just at Aberdeen, but any club. Um, right. Because in those days there was no you know, professional youth set up. You played a school team, boys club, and if you were good enough, um, the team would put you in the reserve. So um, it, was, it was a tough upbringing, but I think it really helped me. David, did you see, just yeah. obviously touching on that, you, you mentioned there was, a, there was a lot of football within a week. How often were you, were you actually playing football? Um, well, if you take a, a Saturday, I would play play for my school team in the morning um, and then play for the reserves in the afternoon. Um, and then if there was a reserve game, I played for the boys club. And then Sunday we had boys brigade. 
So we put, I played in the boys' brigade team and sometimes it was boys' club games. And then I would train for the school team. We'd probably train twice a week. The youth team, would, boys' club would probably train about two, three times a week. And then and on a Monday night, I went to Petodby to train. So uh, lots and lots of football. I think that's why maybe my career came to an end at, you know, 28, 29, 30. Mm-hmm. At the yeah. same time, I know, because we, we, we find that struggle sometimes to get some of the boys to play with the school teams. You know, yeah. maybe doing the personal training has, has been a common one. But sometimes yeah. just playing and playing regularly is is a, a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think as well. I mean, when we were kids as well, there was no PlayStation. There was only three channels on television. So the only thing you could do was play football. And mm-hmm. out with those training, as soon as it, you know, you, you maybe go and play the reserves and I come home at night go get changed and go out and play my mates in the park at night. Um, that's just the, the way it was. Things are totally different. And I see it with my kids as well. You know, it's just, just times have changed. Mm-hmm. Did you yeah. say growing up, when you're talking about the, the training you were at, was it quite technical or do you think it was just, was it a lot of just game-based, just playing? All of it was games. Um, I, I remember, even at, being at a young age, there wasn't a lot of tactical stuff. You almost just had to work it out yourself. Yeah. Um, I actually, I remember seeing some of Gordon Strachan saying about coaches that, you, you know, when, you, when you're a young kid, all you do is just experiment with the ball. I'd be in the back garden playing, um, just totally non-stop. You, I, you just would always have a ball, keep playing all the time. Yeah. Um, but it's just, it's totally changed now. There's just too many distractions. Yeah. Was that the team that you grew up supporting in, David Aberdeen? Yeah, it was. I didn't, um, I wasn't interested in football till I was about eight years old. Um, right. Which is quite, quite old, really. Um, and we're only... I only became interested because Aberdeen won the, the League Cup in 1976 to beat Celtic 2-1. And my mum and dad took me down the Union Street open top bus and yeah. watching all that kind of stuff. And after that, I got hooked on football. And, you know, my dad had a season ticket at Petaudry. And, you know, if I wasn't playing, I'd go and watch um, Aberdeen play. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to see, I was even a ball boy when they beat Bayern Munich in the Cup Winners' Cup in 83. So, yeah. you know, a lot of memories here. And obviously, being a local boy, it was just great to, to play for Aberdeen. Yeah. You just, okay. you just lost my the queue there. I thought it was because you, you mentioned Rangers and you just signed <laughs> out. <laughs> no. No. Um, it's, 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 living, it's living in East End of Glasgow. Somebody's uh, is, um, vandalised the Wi-Fi by the phone. <laughs> 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 Did you have any part-time jobs in, David, when you were younger? Um, the only job I've had um, while I was playing, well, when I was a kid, was delivering the citizen, the old circular yeah. um, newspaper. I, I even remember now that I delivered, I got £2.19 and I delivered 243 papers um, wow. once a week. But I didn't I, last. I soon got fed up with doing that, so that was my one and only job. Yeah. Superb. Were there ever any old school jobs? Heard of cleaning the stands, cleaning the boots, anything like that? Oh, that, yeah, yeah. We had to, Fergie was, I was in the ground staff and I left at 16 and the job I had to do, I had to look after the home dressing room. And um, in those days, it was red, red and grey, I think it was um, tiles, but they're like hairy tiles, carpet tiles. And I had to use a brush. You couldn't use a vacuum cleaner, you had to use a brush. And I used to think to myself, what is the point in doing this? Surely it's easier just using a vacuum cleaner. Um, and then you soon realise that what, what he's trying to do is trying to toughen you up and he's trying to break yeah. you more than anything. And, you know, the first time you do it, it takes about two hours. And, you know, then you soon get a hang of it. It takes you 20 minutes. Uh, but it's just something. And I know, I don't know if it still happens in the game today, but we had a lot of things we had to do. We didn't clean boots, but we had to wash the kits. We had to set the kits out in the, for the first team. Um, and then you get guys like Willie Miller and John McMaster that would, you know, make a bit of a fool of you, tell you that it's the wrong shorts, and you go and look for a pair of shorts that don't exist. Um, so there's a lot of pranks are played, um, but again, it it grows you up, and it certainly um, it, it 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 makes you more of a man. And, and coming from Aberdeen, a lot of people from Aberdeen, certainly in my time, you're very introverted and shy. Um, just like you know, the, I remember the Glasgow S ones would come up to Petrodri, and they just sort of not bully us, but they beat the hell out of us. Um, and Aberdonians would just sit there terrified to even look at them. So I think like Fergie's um, approach to 
toughening you up, take you get come out of your shell, it really helped. Brilliant. Well, um, I'm going to ask the next question then, David, about your professional playing career. Um, so just to start us off then, what has your career journey been like? Maybe from starting off your first professional contract and then... Yeah, yeah well, I signed it at 16. Um, obviously, left school at the Christmas time, but I was playing the reserves at that time. Um, and I was very fortunate that I joined the ground staff when I did the, the apprenticeship. And I was, I was only really an apprentice for six months. Um, and then I think it was just... I was 17, it was the start of my second season, and um, I actually uh, played in the first team. Um, yeah. But the first game was actually a pre-season game against Dunfermline at East End Park. We, um, I remember you know, Fergie was in charge of the game, and, and he, he was very good at the way he managed people, and he didn't let you have time to think that you're going to play. So I went down in the bus, there was 18 players, and only 13 can get stripped, and you think you're going there just to carry the bags and carry the and then he names me in the team. Um, this is a pre-season game. And I remember just before half-time, I got for a header and John Watson elbows me in the face, knocks my two front teeth out and uh, says to me, welcome to the big league, son. <laughs> so at half-time, I walk in and there's blood pouring out my, my face and there's, I would get two front teeth missing. And I'm feeling sorry for myself. I'm hoping that Fergie's going to take me off. And he comes in and he just, as I go at me, slaughters me. Are you a man or a mouse? You get yourself back out there and, prove that you can play in this team and, and all. so to be fair I did um, and then I think they went away we went away on a pre-season tour to Germany I wasn't involved in that and then when they came back after about three games Tommy McQueen broke his leg um, and suddenly um, I was in the team and just out of the blue there was no build up you know you see some players that gradually come in the, in the squad on the bench um, but it wasn't like me it was just straight in um, and again, he didn't tell me I was going to play, not until, what, maybe an hour and a bit before the, the game, named, and it was named a sub, we're playing Hamilton in the league, and I came on, I think, with 30 minutes to go, and then after that, I played 44 games that season, so it was, uh, I'd never really had time to think, you know, and, and suddenly, and from that day on, I basically played every club I was at, until I got injured at Leeds, I basically played every game, and there was never a time, when, apart from those injured, I ended I was never really sort of in the reserve or anything. Yeah. And I, had a, I had a big thing that I didn't think I was good enough to play. Um, and I think it all started later on when I was at primary school. I actually went for the, the primary school tryouts and I didn't make the team. And um, there was someone, I think one of the kids must have been ill or, or something on the Friday. So I was a notice, a notice board and said that my name was in it. So it was actually a sub. So I got in the team by default, it was a sub, and I got subbed on, then I got subbed off again, I was that bad. So um, I think I've always felt, you know, when you go into the Aberdeen dressing room, Rangers dressing room, Leeds, I always had this complex, I, I wasn't good enough to be there. Yeah. Um, I think every game I played, I treated it as if this might be the last game I ever play, because if I have a bad game, they'll bring someone else in. So there's always a bit of confidence in, in my own ability. Yeah. Um, but at Aberdeen, I was so fortunate that when I got in the team, you know, it was, it was coming at the end of the, the glory days at Aberdeen. You know, there was, was a back four. There was Jim Layton, Stuart McKimmy, uh, Willie Miller, Alec McLeish, myself. And there was like yeah. Jim Bell, Simpson, Billy Stark, yeah. Peter Weir. You know, a lot of you know, yeah. big names um, at Aberdeen. So I was very fortunate early part of my career to have a good grinding with those guys. Yeah. Do you feel like it, it helped you almost in the reverse of that? Like, you felt like you were proving yourself or trying to prove yourself every single game? Yeah, it, 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 it does. Um, I, I honestly, you know, every time I made a mistake, um, I used to analyse it and it used to eat away at me because I'm thinking that mistake, I might not get in the, the team the next game. Um, which, you know, I think you're right, it probably did help me the opposite way. It was like when my transfer fee came um, to range of just under a million and a lot of people said, Do you, you know, is that a lot of pressure? And I goes, no, actually gives me confidence that somebody's willing to pay that kind of money for me. Um, so I was at a different to a lot of players. Um, and not a lot of people know that I lacked that bit of confidence. Yeah. So you're touching on when you signed your first professional contract. How did that feel then? Um, well, obviously it was through Alec Ferguson. Um, yeah. So that was great. Um, there was no mobile phones in those days. So, you know, it was all dial-up phone. Um, and, you know, I think it was Lenny Taylor, who was a youth set. You know, fair, this was the S-form um, that uh, Aberdeen wanted to sign as an S-form. So we did that. You go down and sign the paper. 
Um, and then from the age of 13 to about 16, you sort of, you're hoping that it turns into a professional contract. And, yeah. you know, it's the last, it's probably the last day of the summer holidays because every time there's summer holidays, the, the young, uh, the S forms go in and the, the guys from all over Scotland come in. And then you get that call into the office, you know, and, and we'd all sit outside in these seats and get called in one by one. No, you're not getting a contract. You're not getting one. Yes, you're getting one. So everybody was nervous. Um, and then you're the happiest man alive when you, you get that contract because you don't even think about what's written on the contract. You just want to sign it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my next question is just about some of the players that you might have played with and against. So you played with some incredible players and you played against some incredible yeah. players. Is there any that stand out? Who would you say is maybe, first of all, the best player that you've played with? Um, I think there's, there's two. Um, it wouldn't surprise you. Uh, Brian Loudwell, by far, um, the best player. Um, but I think when he came in to the team, I, I, I thought, when we played a pre-season game against Clyde, I thought, God, he's not that very good. You know, I don't think he's, he's, he's a bit of a hype. And, and then I realised that he was a bit like two steps ahead of everybody else. It was, it was neither yeah. wasn't very good. Um, and then we, we ended up in a good partnership. He was just a, you know, a great player. And I think in that Rangers team at the time, you know, the, the, the few years prior to that, we were a good hard-working team. But when Gazas and Loudrops come in, we had somebody who could actually win the game on their own. Um, yeah. and they give the ball to him, release a bit of pressure. It was him and then, um, believe it or not, Peter Weir, um, the guy who played at Aberdeen. He helped me a lot as a kid. I was 17, he was coming to the end of his career, but encouraged me a lot. And, and even in his mid-30s, he was still an, an incredible player. Um, but I've been fortunate, you know, I've had, obviously, like guys like Gaza and Richard Goff, even down yeah. the lead. you got guys like Jimmy Floyd, Hasselbank, Harry Kuehl. Um, yeah. So I've been very fortunate to, to have played with some great players. I think, like some Mark Haley, I don't yeah. think I realise until now how good a player he was. I think, for some reason, he was... You know, Super Ali got all the, the plaudits. Um, but I think, you know, you watch videos of YouTube, he was an incredible player, Mark. Um, and then again, players were played against. It's always been the unknown players that have given me a, a bit of a hard time. I used to have a hard time against a guy called Evo Den Beeman. Um, he was at Dunfermline, Montrose. Yeah. Every time he played against him, he destroyed me. Um, and I had no idea what he was doing. Um, but I think player-wise, you know, I've been fortunate enough to play against Beckham, Giggs, um, Ray Parlar, obviously De Canios, Joe Miller, which I, I enjoy playing against him. Um, so but I've been fortunate to play against some incredible players. You know, Alan Shearer, you know, when you go down to the Premiership, the Premiership is, in those days, certainly was a, a big step up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you just on that point, David, is it, obviously you, you went from Rangers to, to then Leeds, was it, is that a, a, a huge step up, was what you first thought? Yeah, well, I, I thought that, you know, bear in mind, I've played in, in the Premier League for about, in Scotland for about 12 years, and you're used to, you play against the same teams four times, you go to the same stadiums, you probably play against the same players like Morris, Malapas and Jim Mack, you know, you see them all the time. And then you go down to the Premiership and, and in those days, look, you could watch it on television and you'd know all about your Arsenal's and Manchester United's. But you would go and play against a Leicester or a Derby or Wimbledon and there were good... Players were very, very good. Players you didn't, weren't too familiar of. So the level yeah. was just a, a bit... It's, it's, I thought it was a step ahead. Everybody was, everybody was physically strong. Um, everybody had pace. And that was a big factor in my game was pace and I needed to add just a little bit more to my game um, because the Rangers for six years I attacked most of the time um, and you go to Leeds and you know George Graham is a very defensive defence-minded coach and we defended a lot in games caught teams on the break so I'm not saying that to learn defending um, but I had to be more cautious of, of when I went forward because you know as I say you're up against gigs over Mars um, yeah. you know Beckham's and all these guys and then you've got Gary Neville's overlapping behind them so you've got to be a little bit more cautious and it is tough you know right. I, think, uh, I think you touched on this but I'm going to ask you anyway it's a, a question that's been sent in by a, a Rangers fan that will remain unnamed a member <laughs> of the teaching staff um, so he said if Loudrop and Gaza were still at the peak and you were the manager and you could only sign one of them who, who would it be? Loudrop I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a, a thing when we both played in the same team, obviously, with me. The one thing about Loudrop was he would always try and find me with a pass. But because Gaza was right footed, he would always go to the right hand side. And 
Mm-hmm. Mike passed me, and probably in what three years I played with him, he must have passed the ball to me about four times. So. <laughs> Selfishly, I allowed him. Gaza only passed the ball when he knew he was getting it back, didn't he? He would probably yeah, pass it behind people. Plus, as well, I think it'd be a lot easier to manage Brian Loud than it would be to manage. <laughs> 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 That's brilliant. Uh, right, so my next question then is just what would you say is the highlight of your professional playing career? This is, where, this is where probably my phone needs to disconnect because this is the Rangers bit, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> that is, yeah. yeah. So, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the year we won the treble um, and probably the last game in that season we played um, Aberdeen at Parkhead, Celtic Park in the, the Scottish Cup final to clinch the treble. So being an Aberdeen, a former Aberdeen player, I used to get so much abuse when I went back there. Um, yeah. And then Willie Miller was a manager of Aberdeen at the time, and he, when I played for Aberdeen when I was a young kid at 17, 18, he would slaughter me every week. So, you know, you just picture this, it was more, probably the most perfect day, you know, you're going for the treble, um, you've got a record amount of points and, and what have you, with a good season in the Champions League as well. You know, so you're going for the treble, you're playing against Celtic, uh, so you're playing against Aberdeen at Celtic Park, you're changing in because Hamden's getting refurbished. You're changing in the yep. uh, Celtic home dressing room. You beat your former team, and the manager of the team at that point is the guy that used to slaughter you. Um, so it was just a, a perfect day, you know, um, just to, to win the treble. But just the way it was, just all the factors towards it. It wasn't the greatest game, but just the factors and just the fact that I didn't realise until after the game how big it was to win the treble. David, see, just on that, I think it was like a personal question, right? And you, you were part of that nine in a row team, right? And obviously, I, I'm, a, I'm a Celtic fan in case you've not realised yet, right? <laughs> but one of, the, one of the things I always wonder is, where, where do the players find the mentality to year after year? Right, okay, you've won it maybe four or five times, but then how do you find that mentality for the next year and the next year after that to keep on going? I think I think the Walter Smith, what he was good at, he would bring in, he'd freshen the team up, he'd bring in two or three big name players and you know, one or two players would come and go. But I think for me as a player, uh, I remember the first time we won the league. The league's the hardest one to win. Um, and I remember that, you know, when you're at Rangers, you're not allowed to lose a game, you're not allowed to draw a game, no matter who you're playing against, no matter how well or bad the team's doing. That's just the yeah. mentality. And I remember the first time we won the league, um, it was obviously it's the first time at Rangers that I'd won the league, first time in my career. And it felt great. But you, you only really celebrated it for a day because you're thinking of the next season. And then after that, each win, each cup you win, each league, it's a relief more than anything. And mm. it's almost like, you know, I remember being at Aberdeen and Leeds. It's like, oh, we might win this. We might win this game. But you have to win at Rangers. And it's that mentality that, you know, there's no option. There's no option in not winning the league. Um, and I don't know how it would have been if in my time if we hadn't won the league. But it's just that, that I know it internally for me, that desire I had was, we have to win, we have to win. There's no, there's no option. And, you know, I'd play with injuries and, um, you know, get, sometimes get injections to play. Just because, it, again, it was that mentality, if I don't play, someone else will play instead. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and, it, and it just spurred me on. But you just, I think every player, you look at the Rangers team, um, you know, that, 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 that sort of nine in a row team. When you look at the guys, you've got like Sylvie and Ferguson, You've got Ian Durant, you've got McCoy, you've got Haitley, you've got Stuart McCall, John Brown, Goffey. All guys that would just run through a brick wall. And, and yeah. I think that it's a mentality, I think, that mentality that... Because um, some players came and, come and went to uh, Rangers. And I'm not saying they didn't fit in, but they were good for a couple of seasons. But these seasons, professionals, they can go on and on and on and, and just, you know, fight for that glory. Even if we're not playing well or you're not playing, you've got injuries. It was just that mentality that we had. Absolutely. You mentioned there uh, Walter Smith. What, what was he like to play under? Well, he was, I think, out of all the managers I've played with under, he's probably been the best for man management. You know, yeah. I think he's managed to keep, in my time, he managed to keep every player happy, even if they weren't playing um, throughout the team or on, on the bench a lot. He's just man management was good. And what I liked, really liked about it more than anything was that there was a spell when, I think it was my second or third season maybe, 
We lost two eight, knocked out by AK Athens, or maybe it's Levski Sofia. And we knocked out of the qualifying rounds of Champions League. We got knocked out of the Cup League Cup to Falkirk, and we got knocked Celtic beat us at Ibrox. Um, and that was all in the space of about ten days. And most managers would feel the pressure. And I know that he was under pressure, um, but he never showed it. Um, any at any point, he kept all the stress and all the you know, the, the pressure away from the players. It was just business as usual. And we would play against Partick and then go and play against Juventus. In the, you know, the, the build-up's the same. There was, no, all the playing, there was no chance for you ever to get nervous before games because he took all that away from you. Yeah. Um, but I remember one thing he said to me when I signed was, you look after me and I'll look after you. And um, as I say, and, and it's no secret when you see old players that have played for him, they still call him the gaffer. Yeah. yeah. I mean. um, okay, my next question then, you, you spoke about loads of highlights there throughout your career, but I was going to ask you about any kind of particular low points um, that maybe helped shape you and helped you be successful after that. Yeah, well, there was two really, um, I had a bad injury at, um, where was it? Well, there was two. Um, I, when I was at Aberdeen, um, I could have played my first League Cup final against Rangers. I think it was the penalty kicks when Peter Nicholas missed the penalty kick. Um, it was the first of three League Cup finals, Aberdeen against Rangers. And I played in the semi-final, and, but I broke my foot in the semi-final and missed the final. So that was a real disappointment. To, you know, your first chance of playing it at Hamden in a cup final, and missed it. Um, so that, that was a big disappointment. But it's mainly injuries more than anything. Um, when I was at Leeds United, you know, when, I, when I arrived at Leeds, I realised in a medical that I had no ACL, cruciate ligament had snapped five years ago. And, mm -hmm. and I'd been playing without it. And as soon as I knew about that, it was, it was a psychological thing. Um, I actually developed a limp. I um, started to limp a little bit. And it was always my back and my mind. Suddenly my knee became sore. And so I was taking all these anti-inflammatory tablets and um, trying everything I could to, to keep the pain away. Yeah. And, and that really sort of finished my career because because of that I played the first almost the first full season and then after that I um, it was like surgery after surgery um, and, and it was just demoralizing but it makes you strong as, as a person you know because you're you're in there and you get an ACL surgery and it's meant to take nine to twelve months in those days so you know that the first day you go in there players have been out training they're going home you've just got all this hard um, basically grueling work to try and get yourself fit with the, with the big possibility that you're not going to get fit. So that, I found that very, very difficult. And then maybe, you know, a big disappointment was when I didn't, um, when, I, when I actually arrived at Leeds United, you know, I thought it'd be great to try something new. I was 27, 28 years old. I'd been in Scotland for 12 years. You know, try something new in the Premiership. And then as soon as I got there, I realised that I've made a mistake uh, leaving Rangers. I think as well, what you'd said about in primary school, when you'd went for the trial and you didn't, yeah. you didn't get into school, I think that's a great message just for some of the kids, because I think yeah. sometimes they'll maybe go to a trial or they'll not make yeah. a team and then they'll, they'll chuck it. And, yeah. and then look at look at yourself, look at the success yeah, yeah. you've had after, after a setback like that. I used to, I, I don't think a lot of times when I'd go for like Scotland schoolboy trials and all these school, Aberdeen schoolboy select and all that kind of stuff. And, I didn't realise it wasn't until afterwards you talked to the coaches years, you know, years after, you know, and I would tell them that oh, I went to that trial, I was a bag of nerves, I didn't think we were going to make it. He says, but you were the best player I've ever been. Yeah. You know, and that was just me that, I didn't, you know, I might have scored three goals in a trial and I just think to my, my dad, Jink, I'll make it, Jink, I'll make it. Um, it's just, uh, yeah. I, I think it was, I think it's a, an Aberdonian thing as well. Um, you know, as I said earlier, that, that we are very introverted and, um, and I think, you know, when you come, I remember when you go down to the, the West Coast, our first um, primary school select, and we went down, we played in Glasgow, went to play in a in a, an Ash Park. And we don't know what's all this, what's, there's no Ash Parks in Aberdeen, what's all this? <laughs> and then you see all the, the sort of confident glass region coming, and, and we were we were beat before we got off the bus. Yeah. yeah. All right. Hey, I think it's over to you then, Mr. McHugh, for coaching career. Yeah, yeah. Right. Hopefully nothing cuts out here, right? Because this is this is the, the good bit, I would say. Um, 
obviously, before we go into the, the Real Cashmere stuff, um, a lot of ex-pros try and find their way after football. You went into the coaching route. Um, why did you decide to go into that route? And was it something that you always intended on doing? No, it's it, it's not something I ever thought that I would do. Um, it's not anything, something that I was really passionate about doing. You know, you obviously play and, and you know, I was relatively fortunate in football that, you know, that I didn't have to go out there and go and have to time find a job. Um, but because I think because I finished a little bit earlier, as soon as I finished earlier playing, um, I actually ran a computer company um, myself and a, and a business partner. We just started it just as I was, during the time I was injured at Leeds, we used to recycle computers and with government contracts and, and what have you. So we had staff, the two of us started and then within about six months with 90 other staff um, oh. in Leeds. So that was, that was, that was good. Um, but then it became a lot, because the area we were in, there wasn't a lot of people to employ. So we're almost employing anyone. And um, there were so many problems came and, you know, the bigger it gets, the harder it gets. And, and eventually I, I sold out and um, Leeds United just did a little bit of, um, what would I say, like community coaching. And it's not something I wanted to do, but I began to miss playing uh, or being involved in football. And then I began to play charity games. Um, you know, I remember I was playing this charity game with Peter Lorimer and Alan Clark and you know, they're probably about 30 years older than me and I'm going about there like Maradona. I'm thinking I can still, I, I think I can make a comeback here. <laughs> so a friend, um, a friend basically said, oh, John Shelton Montrose, you know, he obviously wanted me to go back as a player, time playing. He, I came back as a player coach. Um, and then since then, he encouraged me to do my B licence um, and I played nine games there. I snapped my Achilles tendon against Morton and, and I knew that was the career completely gone. And then shortly after that, uh, Elgin City asked me to be the, the coach uh, yeah. and the manager at Elgin. So I went there um, and then I really enjoyed it. You know, I think going at a completely different level. Um, you know, Elgin City, we had, um, we had guys that trained in Glasgow, we had guys that trained in Dundee, we had guys, you know, yeah. from islands off Inverness. So, you know, I found the challenge was, you know, was pretty good because a lot of the times, you know, you might have seven at training. And you couldn't plan anything for the weekend. You couldn't work on anything. Yeah. Um, and that, that was, a, obviously, I'd never experienced that levels before. And it was something yeah. that really opened my eyes. And, but, you know, I enjoyed that part. Was, was that when Elgin were in the Highland League? Or then the no, it was the, the bar, I think it was our third season in the, what do you call it? Third season in the division uh, third division it was then. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's finished bottom and then second bottom. So when yeah. I took over, I, I was in three games before the end of the season, finished up second bottom. The first season, they were, for my first full season, we were still second bottom because it took me about time to get used to the league. And then the following season, we were fifth. We just missed out in the playoffs. And then the following season, I resigned after a failed takeover bid from um, the guy who was my assistant at the time. Um, and I think we were sitting in the playoff positions when I resigned. So um, we did well I mean, a lot of people don't understand that, you know, at part-time level, you know, places yeah. like Elgin and Montrose, and they're miles away from anywhere, and it's hard to get the players. Yeah, yeah. Yes, nice. And then, obviously, um, after Montrose and Elgin, could you tell us then about your, your journey um, and how you ended up in Kashmir? Well, actually, after... Um, I went back to Montrose again. I went back there for a second spell. I, I was only a couple of months just politics had decided to, to get out and uh, I went to America for 10 years and um, so I coached a, a club Sereno Soccer Club which is a youth I ended up being the executive director then I took over the was the head coach of Phoenix FC which is now Phoenix Rising where Didi had drug buyers for a season they ran out of money and that's when they were taken over by someone else and then I was getting a little bit disillusioned with uh, the American lifestyle you know it's I've got, I've got no problem working, but, you know, it got to a point when I was coaching three teams. I was running the club, I was doing board meetings, I was paying wages, I was doing, you name it, I was doing it. And I, I never had a minute to myself. So um, I got, in the space of about two months, I got offered a, a position in, in Uganda, China and Kashmir. And <clears throat> I, to this day, I've still got no idea why I chose Kashmir. Because... <laughs> 
um, I knew nothing about Kashmir at all, nothing about India. Um, but my only recollection of India is um, an idiot abroad, with Carol Pilkington, that's the only <laughs> thing I can relate to India. So I did no, no research, but I think it's the, you know, you want to be involved in football and I wanted to get back in the professional environment. And it's very, very difficult to get back in anywhere. So I decided that, hey, I'm, I'm going to have a go at this. And I did no research. I knew it was in India somewhere. Um, and I remember I just jumped on a flight. My wife wasn't talking to me at the time, so she wasn't too happy. And um, I had no idea that Kashmir was a war zone. I had no idea that um, all the stuff that was on there, there was no internet. I thought everywhere in India was hot. This is but Kashmir's only place for four seasons with the harshest winter ever. So I ended up, um, you know, just jumping on this flight and, you know, landed in after, I think I actually left on a Friday from, I was in America at the time, left from Phoenix on the Friday. I arrived in Kashmir on Monday. Well, so uh, took a long, long, long uh, journey to get there. So as soon as I got there, after about two weeks, I, I thought to myself, what have I done? Why am I coming here? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, for anybody that's, that's watching and hasn't seen that documentary, you need to watch it, The Return of Real Kashmir on KCI. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, obviously, the, the big chunky part is obviously on Real Kashmir. Um, as you've, you've, you've mentioned, uh, mentioned briefly there, but what are some of the challenges about working away from, obviously, home and, and your family? Well, I think, obviously, away from home is difficult. Um, but... I think the hardest part is the communication part because in Kashmir, um, it's 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 like a vicious cycle. I I, I went um, January two thousand seventeen, so it was high the winter. I'd only been there two days, and then it was snowing. We couldn't train. Uh, we ended up going indoors. Um, it was it turned out it was actually somebody's house we were training in, somebody's front room. We took the furniture out and trained in there. Um, so you obviously. It, and in Kashmir, what they do is they sell elect electricity to the rest of India. So every area in, in, in Kashmir, in Srinagar, the, the, the capital, two hours, three times a day, you don't have any electricity. Oh. So, and obviously, internet is, you've got to use electricity to get the internet. So you, you've, you've got a minimum of six hours without internet. Um, so even, even look, the boredom and not being able to call home or, or talk home, what happens is, is that you know you want to watch Premiership, and in and, and India this you show the games. There's one three, it's three, it's three o'clock. I think it's three o'clock, five o'clock, seven o'clock, nine o'clock. So you can watch football all the time, and you sit down and watch it, and you think, ah, oh. then the power's out. You know, so you can't watch. There's no power. Power's out, and then you wake up in the morning, and because it, the power's out and it's winter time, there's no heat, and so you're so cold at night. You, you don't really sleep. You go up in the morning, and you think that I need a cup of tea or something to warm up, but you can't because there's no electricity for a kettle. And then more, a lot of the times in Kashmir, there's no internet. The, the government have got this thing where if there's a, a, an encounter or there's some, um, you know, some political issue, the government can just flick of a switch, switch the internet off, and it can oh. be off for days. You know, so you can't, you always know, you wake up in the morning and if you're looking at WhatsApp and there's a little thing, it just keeps spinning around and you know, oh, well, some, something bad's happened here. And then maybe for a day or so you can't can't talk home. Um, so that's that's the, the, that's the most difficult thing. Um, and obviously the culture as well is completely different. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the first time I went there, I went to the owner's house. Uh, there's two owners. This was the the original owner, which is um, uh, Shamim. So I go to his house, and you know, I, I'm used to living in America or, or Britain, and, and I get there, I go into his house, and there's no furniture in the dining room. There's a big cloth on the floor, um, and you sit down. You actually sit down and eat, and they all eat with their hands. Um, and it's and it, but it's like a big it's like a big banquet, you know. And you see people eat with their hands. It's just a lot of things. It just takes so much getting used to. And I mean, it's second nature now. Um, and then you walk around Srinagar, or you, you drive through it, and there's every street corner there's um, Indian army there with guns. So you're talking, I think the ratio is one Indian soldier for every 12 Kashmiris. Um, so, you know, and, and it, can be a, it can be a pretty volatile place. We're lucky that we're, you know, we're guarded a little bit from it. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, things going on. And as I said at the start, I had no idea how, 
how bad the, the situation is there at times. Yeah. yeah. It seems as if there's a lot of tensions in Kashmir between the, the different kind of countries, isn't there? Yeah, it's, I, think, um, I think basically Kashmir want to be independent. Um, mm -hmm. more than, they want to have their own, their own country. Um, you know, the talk about um, India and Pakistan and, and, and all that kind of stuff, because it's basically placed in the middle of it. But I think they just want their own independence. Um, you know, I think it's a little bit like, you know, in Scotland as well, you know, there's all the independence things going on. And, and I think it's the, maybe the older generations in Kashmir want, are proud of Kashmir and want to keep it the same, you know, because it's a, it's a beautiful place. There's mountains and lakes and, um, yeah. you know, it's an amazing part of the world. You know, obviously there's just certain things that go on. Um, but the people of Kashmir, they're just so used to it. You know, they're happy people. Believe it or not, they're actually quite happy people. Um, you know, they're used to shutdowns. It's just part of their life. It's just something that, oh, all the shops are closed for a week. Okay, that's fine. Oh, there's no internet. Oh, that's okay. It's just yeah. part of their life. It's just something that they're used to. And, and they're neither up or down about it. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. McHugh, is that where you get your Wi-Fi? You're getting yours sent from Kashmir? <laughs> quite, quite possibly. Um, obviously, we're all well aware of the documentary itself. But what was that experience like? Sort of having a camera crew following you around and, and detailing your every move. That was obviously different. Yeah, it's. Um, I remember Greg, um, Greg Clark, the the producer. He was actually a, a cousin of Derek Lilly, a guy that I played with at Leeds United. So. I remember after we won League Two, he he got in touch with me and said he wants to pitch an idea to the BBC. So which he which he did, um, and obviously I, I spent a lot of time with him. Um, he did like a trailer thing before. I had to tell him a story about you know a certain incident that happened when I was there, just to sort of sell it to the to the BBC. So that all went well. But um, it's because you become a friend with him that you forget he's there. So yeah. in the morning, what he does is he puts a microphone on you, tapes it up, and a lot of the times it's cold in Kashmir, so you've got thick jackets on, so you forget the microphone's on. Um, and, you know, I think it, he's probably there for about maybe four or five weeks, one time, and he comes back for another four or five weeks. So after a while, because he's friendly, you know, it's more of a friend than anything else, you totally forget you've got the microphone. And it's not until after... I blow up or I say something, I walk out and I think, oh no, I can't, because I, oh, no, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did this. So the first time the documentary, I hadn't seen it um, before it got aired, really. I, I saw it the day before and I was terrified because there's a timeline. I had no idea what was going to get shown. And there's a timeline that you think, oh no, it's coming up to this bit. Oh no, it's in, it's in. And I knew that all the controversial things and all the blow ups were always going to be on. And afterwards, like if I do something, I remember there was one time in the first one when I shouted and, um, and I walked off. It was a youth team and they kicked us off the park. I walked off and I'm walking down the track and, and, I, and, I, and then I walk back and I say, Greg, tell me that's not going in. And he goes, oh, that's going in, that's going in. <laughs> so the second time it was a lot easier because you know what's going to go in. But it's, it's I actually said to myself the second time, I'm not going to swear so much, I'm going to be more calm. But just the situation of the whole, Kashmir as a whole, the, 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 the club at times, the people who work at the club, it's so frustrating. And, yeah. and you do snap. And I think it's just the passion that, that I've got, um, yeah. obviously for the game, but also for the, the club, you know, because the clubs came from virtually nothing to where it is yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, but it's just, uh, it's, it's a weird feeling because, you know, there are times as well when, He'll take you somewhere and he says, right, I want you to do this. And you're tired and you're, and, and you're just not motivated enough to do it. And he says, I can't put that in. I can't put that in. So then you've got to sort of change your attitude a little bit. Um, but it's, it's, it's difficult. It's very, very yeah. difficult. You've only you certainly mellowed in the, in the second episode, but a couple of points that stood out for me, mid-team talk, and a couple of guys are bringing in, bringing in some food uh, as you <laughs> well, that, that was that was at the start of the season. We had this um, Duran Cup. It's like a pre-season tournament, and um, what really got me more than anything was, and it happens in India all the time. Is it 
When a dressing room door is closed in Britain, no one, you've got to knock or no one comes in. They yeah, yeah. just walk in. They just walk in. So they had a stretcher carrying ice for a cool down after the game. And, and <laughs> it happens all the time. I don't, I don't know how many times I've, I've been talking at half time. And they're, they're coming in with cut fruit. They're walking in with cut fruit. I go, what are you doing? Just get out. But, they, but they, they just do it because, again, it's probably my fault that I haven't sort of bought into certain things. You know, you still expect things to be like what it is back home. And, and I know that I've spoken to other coaches in the league and, and they say that's just how it is. You know, I remember um, we played a, a game against um, Phil Brown's team, Hyderabad, and then we played against, um, what's his name, John Gregory. He was at, he was at Chennai and, and it was quite funny. You talk to them and, and you, you talk about all the funny stories and he says, you can't believe it. And, and you'll tell them a story and they'll say, oh, I've got a better one than that. And, oh, I've got a better one than that. Because it's just, um, it's, it's bizarre and I think that the longer I've been there you might it doesn't show it in the documentary but you sort of you get used to it and you laugh at a lot of things yeah. you know you, every day you wake up and you know that there's going to be some disaster there was one this was quite a funny one last season so we've got this ball boy called Google and um, he's, he's tiny he's only about he's only about five foot or something this little Kashmiri guy great guy so we get to the training and he says uh, he says, uh, Coach, um, I don't have the balls today. I goes, what do you mean? He says, I took them home and I washed them. I says, all right. He says, but you won't need them today, will you? I'm going, no footballs. Didn't have one football train. Have you ever it's seen been, Mike Bassett, England manager? <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. Exactly like that. <laughs> but that's, that's what they're like. They, they, I'm not saying they don't think. They, they actually, they're, they're good people. They're trying to do something good, but they don't realise it. But if they do that, someone, someone else isn't going to work. Yeah, you know, yeah. I remember our first game, first live game on on TV when we got in the league, we got, we got a player called Love Day, the captain, and because we were sponsored by Adidas, there was all these photo shoots and big uh, publicity stuff. So what they did is they took a jersey, game jersey, and it says Love Day on it, number six. So it was a way they were taking pictures and what have you. So we get to the, I go to the ground, and it, that's when I blow up in the first one when nothing's done. So I go there and you look at the jerseys, it's one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. So six isn't there, it's just a big hole. And Loveday's sitting there and I says, where's the kit? And somebody says, eh, oh, it's at a hotel. I go, why is it a hotel? We've got a game in an hour, we need it. Oh no, it's okay, we've got one here. So we get, get one and it's like number 52 and it's got somebody else's name on it. And I says, it has to be the same because before the game, they verify, the, the referees come in, verify the, the name and the number, and they're, they've got ID pictures and everything. But it's almost like everything's a shortcut with them. Yeah. You know, they don't think, you know, I, I bet you the guy woke up in the morning and he says, like, oh, I'm at the ground, but it's going to take me five minutes to drive back. Ah, we'll be okay, we'll get away with it. You know, just the way <laughs> they are. A nightmare at times. I've just got a question for you as well, David. Um, what, what's the standard like across there compared to what you've been used to in, in Britain? I would say it's the probably the bottom half of the, the Premier League in Scotland to the top half of the Championship. Um, right. And I say that because of the, the foreigners, although they've changed the rule this year. Up until this year, you could have six foreign players. So right. I, had, I had four Africans and I had Callum Higginbottom and I had obviously Son Mason. But yeah. the two, uh, the four, four, you know, I've got this striker, he's six foot seven. Um, striker and he's a very very good player and they could all play in the Premier League in Scotland but the problem right. is is that there's thousands probably millions of um, African players that yeah. can't get visas in yeah. India the, the easiest place in the world to get a visa a working visa right. uh, you know there's a I don't even remember what's the guy's name Willow Flood yeah. was going to go to the Philippines or somewhere but he couldn't get a visa because his last club wasn't in the top league, you know, and here's Mason playing part time for Peter Head. He gets a visa in, in India, so that's yeah. the level is very, very high. Yeah, yeah, superb. Um, I think we've lost Mr. McHugh again. I think oh, yeah. here he comes. Yeah. I've, I've got a quick question just on on the documentary. I was I was just rewatching it actually this morning. Can I ask you about the two turkeys that you signed just about Christmas two time? Turkeys. Oh, I know. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, what happened to them? Oh. 
So Sandeep, the, the owner, he's, he's like, he, obviously it's fantastic. It's his hotel we stay in. Yeah. So he says, like, because there was four of us, or five of us from Britain, and obviously we celebrate Christmas, and this will be our second Christmas away from home. So he said, what, what do we need? What do you need? What do we need? And I goes, well, I need turkey, I need this, I need that. I'll go and cook the dinner. I'll do it. Okay, no problem. How many turkeys? And I goes, we'll get two in case somebody else wants. And I was expecting a turkey to get in Tesco or something, you know, hanging up. So he, so he says, like, yeah, turkeys are here. So I go in the room, and I'm looking at the wall. I'm thinking, where are they? And then I look down, here they are, they're all eating rice. And then, obviously, they go away and they, they kill them and, and do whatever. Um, we'll have to do with them, but it, it was awful. Right, that's, it's funny, Greg didn't put in a documentary, and I, somebody says, uh, what's wrong with you? I says, oh, there's two, um, two turkeys there. And he goes, uh, what's that for, for Christmas dinner? He says, I'm sure I heard one of them singing last Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> do you know, there was another bit, and, it was the, and I was laughing away, there was one of the wee boys had a man new top on, but it said Manchester Faster. Oh, Man Faster United. Man Faster, oh, sorry, Man Faster United. All the copies they've got, and then I think there's, a, there's one as well, Chelsea, and it's spelled C-H-E-L-S-I. Uh, but you said uh, to him, have you got a way top? Man Slow United. Man Slow United. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'm not sure if you're still with us. No, I think we've lost him again. I think we've lost him again. I think he is yeah. getting his Wi-Fi from Kashmir. <laughs> Let him cut off. It must be the two hours. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll the ask his, oh, he might, he might be back. I'll give him a wee. Yeah. Next yeah. sentence or so, and if not, then I'll ask him. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Oh, sorry. Right, I'm, if, as long I want to try and ask all these questions. The Kashmir Mourinho, you've got a really frosty relationship with, with this one coach who then turns out to be the stadium announcer. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but he's, uh, he's the coach that... Um, in, so in, in, in Kashmir, basically, we're the only real professional team there. Um, the rest of them, there's government teams. So there's the J&K Bank. So there's the J&K Bank, there's um, AG's office, there's Forest Commission, Electricity. They've all got like teams. So basically, you leave school, you get a government job, but all you do is play football. And so you can't play football anymore, then you maybe work as a clerk in the bank. So it's, 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 it's good security for them all. Everybody wants to get the government jobs. So the guy, um, his name is Allah. He um, he's the, the manager of the the J and K Bank. So every time we play friendly games against him, he just kicks the team, or you know, he just you can't have a normal game. Yeah. You know, any team in, in Kashmir, I know that if it's a friendly game, you know, behind closed doors, you just want a normal game. But they don't give you a normal game. They've got all yeah. these players sitting, everybody behind the ball, and you just want a normal game. And he just. He, he just winds me up all the time, you know, because he, he was actually, there's another team, uh, Lone Star. So there's Lone Star, Real Kashmir. Lone Star's been going for about 10 years. And they were in the I League 2, the same league as us, but we were only in, only in there for two years. So we got promoted, and he's never managed to get promoted because he was the manager of both teams. And I think there's a bit of jealousy. Um, and they won't try and help. They'll try and make things difficult with players, you know, because there's only one pitch, that's the only pitch in, in Srinagar that we can train in, and loads and loads of teams that train on it. And they'll make, they'll make you know, problems by saying, oh, no, we can't train here, we have to train this time. You know, sometimes we train at six, seven in the morning. Um, but it's just, he's awkward, and he's, he's a nice enough, oh, away from football, that's a nice enough, but like all the people there, you know, it's obviously if they beat you or they cause you problems, it's a feather on their cap, but it's just... You know, and, and but he gets under my skin all the time on the pitch. I'm off the pitch, he's fine, you know. But on the pitch, I just lose it with him. Brilliant. And then just just that last couple. In terms of your, how would you say your, what your management style is? Um, <clears throat> well, believe it or not, it's actually different to what you see on TV. Um, yeah. You know, um, if, if you if you notice a very, I, I never really shout at the players. It's all about circumstances out with my control. You know facilities or people um, because I've got a great relationship with uh, with all the players you know that they'll, they'll yeah. be to me now when, when we're not there together um, I'm a very positive coach with them um, but the way we had to play at the early part um, in League 2 because we had the lowest budget in League 2 
So basically, I I set out to basically be a team very very difficult to to lose to, um, and then we've got a couple of match winners in the team, and, and that worked. And we took it into the the first season. We finished third. We played the same way because my my theory was a new club if you get battered because there's only 20 league games, so there's not a lot of room for error. So my my idea was if you get battered in five nothing in a game. It's going to be hard to recover from it, and you could end up getting relegated. And I know how difficult it was to get promoted. So I, my my main objective was to finish, you know, out with relegation. Um, first season we finished third, we did well, and then um, this past season it was virtually the same. Although we tried to, we were a little bit of a back to front kind of team to start with, and then you know we're gradually beginning to play in certain areas of the park. Um, and I think it's down to the fact now we've got more money we can play, we can pay decent money to players. Um, yeah. So it's um, it's I'm definitely different to what people um, people think. Oh, he's old school, whatever. But I'm not really. You know, it's just, um, I, I get all my bad moments get caught in an hour. <laughs> but the the ending is is pretty emotional, is what I would say. Um, so the two things I've got for that is will there be any more uh, documentaries? And the second part is obviously in relation to yourself. Where do you? Where's your aspiration going forward now in your in your own managerial career? Um, I think as far as the documentary, I think the BBC want to do a third one, um, but we're not sure if if it'll go. We don't know what will happen, you know, because I think the the feedback for the the two of them has been good, and I think the the gamble of doing a second one is it might not be as good as the first. Um, so I think they've got to make sure that if they do another one, it's better than the first two. Um, otherwise, it's a case like Jaws, and every time you see Jaws, it's um, it gets worse and worse. So, um, but as far as myself, it's a difficult one. I'd obviously like to be a manager in Scotland, um, but you know, opportunities are few and far between. I'm not sure if the documentary does me justice uh, to get that, even though you know things I deal with on a day to day basis and how I've you know not single handedly transformed something into nothing into something. Yeah, but. You know, the one thing that would be hard, believe it or not, is it's actually the perfect job, but it's just in the wrong place. Um, you know, I've got a great relationship with the owner. I've been there basically since the start. I've seen it grow. You know, when, when I first went there, there was no dressing rooms. There was no balls that each player took their own ball. There was no training kit. They were wearing Manchester United kits and all different stuff. There was no dressing rooms, nothing, no floodlights. And now there's floodlights, we're sponsored by Adidas, you know, there's documentaries, there's, um, there's, there might actually be a TV series um, in the near future, and there's talks of that. There's actually a Bollywood movie being made um, on the club. So as much as I'd love to be here, be close to family and, um, you know, coaching in Scotland or England or whatever, it would be very, very difficult to leave, you know, the situation I've got. And very difficult because I'm the only coach they've ever had. It'd be difficult to see someone else coach the team. Mm. So I think it's it's a bit of an emotional tie. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like every day I talk to Sandeep, the the owner, and you know we discuss what's going to happen next season. And he's been so supportive. He's looked after me and Mason, my family. He takes my wife over. My daughter's been over as well. So just just a great guy. Um, and I'd hate to leave. Him and and, and people at Kashmir are fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, certainly that's a feeling because obviously you've got two different emotional pools, haven't you? You've got your own family, and then yeah. it's, a, it's a, your second family as well. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I find when I'm there, um, the early part when I'm there of the season, I want to come home, mm -hmm. um, and I always look for a date when I come come home because I'm, I'm there for basically eight months. But then when I'm back here, I'm thinking about, well, I'm planning for next season, but I'm trying to think, you know, I'm actually, I wish the season was starting. It's just, it's weird. It's just a really yeah. weird. Yeah. I think your wife heard Mr. McHugh asking about potentially leaving Kashmir and she came in. I know. Brilliant. Can I ask just one last question just before, because I think you're going to do the finish on Mr. McHugh. Sorry, Ann. Yeah. Unlike Mr. McHugh, I'm impartial and I don't support either side of the old firm. <laughs> uh, I just I wanted to ask about Gascoigne. If you had any funny stories from the dressing room, him or McCoy, for example. Um, well, I think that I think everybody's heard most of the stories. The, the one thing about Gaza that 
I've probably got a different memory of Gaza, really, is that, and it's not exactly, it's not funny at all, but it's just, if we play like Hearts or Hibs or Dun United or Aberdeen or whatever, for some, I was always sick. I was a kind of shy guy at Rangers and I would always sit on my own. For some reason, um, Gaza was sitting next to me in the bus coming back and he would just tell me about this is going to be in the newspaper tomorrow and you could actually tell what a lonely person he is and I was, I ended up being his agony aunt. Nice. Um, although, when you look at where he is now, I don't think I helped much. Um, but um, it was just sad and, you know, I, th I think it's just sad how he's, his life's ended up. You know, there's a lot of people that wanted to be his mate and hung on to him and, and now they're, they're nowhere to be seen. Um, yeah. But I was one, there was one, um, one story when he, he, he had this teeth, well, he had virtually no teeth at the front, and Ian Durant used to call him a fresher mouth. So uh, one day he goes, he, he, obviously one afternoon, he gets so much stick, because uh, uh, Rangers are uh, dressed and there's a lot of, you know, pelters fly, fly about. So he goes away to the dentist and comes back, and he's got these teeth, and it looks like, uh, you know, Jonathan Watson with Frank McAvenny. Yeah. Massive teeth, and it's like that, and everybody just, you know, everyone's having a go at him and everything. And Walter actually turns around and he says, Gaza, get yourself away to Dennis and get a couple of inches taken off of there. <laughs> um, obviously, leading on to that, uh, uh, Gascoigne, a, a fantastic player. If you were to sign three players for Real Gascoigne, one or alive, who would they be and why? Um, I would... Go for. I can maybe speak to my manager. I can maybe speak to my manager if you'd like as well, and I can come over. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It'd be cheap as um, I would say definitely. Obviously, definitely Brian Loudwell. Yeah, I think he's just just because I've played with and against him, and yeah. um, even in training, him um, uh, just for for who he is. And I would probably say uh, Diego Maradona. Uh, yeah. Just, I think just he's so he's so tough. You know, he obviously he's got a, he's a bit of a wayward character, but. Um, I, I remember watching when I was a kid in the World Cup. So just, I mean, I thought it was, the game was quite tough when I played tackles and everything. But back then, you know, I mean, I remember one game they played against Uruguay, and they just, they just kicked him every time they the ball kicked him. He kept getting back up, and um, you know, I, I don't think a lot of the superstars could maybe do what he did or continue to play. So he's definitely yeah. another one. And then, um, who would I say? Possibly um, Barese. Um, yeah. Frank Barese. He was one that I admired. Was a, he, was, he was probably a bit like Willie Miller and, and those guys. You know, a bit like, you don't get them now, Sweetbirds guy that just uh, float around the back and read the game. Um, but he was always uh, a casual kind of a, a a player. Um, that's three, but probably one more. If I could add one more, Maldini, just because I sort of yeah. didn't model myself on him, but he was just uh, the model professional. And... Um, you know, at one point I, I almost went to Italy um, when I was at Rangers. I almost signed for Inter Milan, and um, well, I would have loved to have been able to. In, in those days, the Italian league was pretty special then. I'd yeah. like to have played there, but Maldini uh, definitely just. And again, I love left-footed players. So, yeah. Put yourself in there, that decent five-a-side football team. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, Major thanks, David, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. No um, problem at all. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, we yeah. hope that we'll be seeing a, a third series. Yeah, well, there's, there's a good chance. There'll be, I think there'll be some something else on television anyway. I think there's, there's a lot of yeah. work about things that's going on. Yeah, um, so just thanks on behalf of the P department for joining us. Um, and for anybody that's watching us today, make sure that you follow us at Bishop PE on Twitter. Um, get onto our Spotify and our YouTube channels as well to... Uh, view all our uh, videos that we've got and our podcasts and uh, thanks very much to Mr Johnson and Mr McHugh for joining as well yeah, thank, thank you very much thanks again David okay, okay thanks a lot okay yeah. cheers David bye cheers bye bye bye, -bye.